Chapter 23. Elizabeth was sitting with her mother and sisters, reflecting on what she had heard and doubting whether she was authorised to mention it when Sir William Lucas himself appeared, sent by his daughter to announce her engagement to the family, to the, to announce her engagement to the family. With many compliments to them and much self-gratulation on the prospect of a connection between the houses, he unfolded the matter to an audience not merely wondering, but incredulous. For Mrs. Bennet, with more perseverance than politeness, protested he must be entirely mistaken, and Lydia, always unguarded and often uncivil, boisterously exclaimed, "'Good Lord, Sir William, how can you tell such a story?' Do you not know that Mr. Collins wants to marry Lizzie? Nothing less than the complacence of a courtier could have borne without anger such treatment, but Sir William's good breeding carried him through it all, and though he begged leave to be positive as to the truth of his information, he listened to all their impertinence with the most forbearing courtesy. Elizabeth, feeling it incumbent on her to relieve him from so unpleasant a situation, now put herself forward to confirm his account by mentioning her prior knowledge of it from Charlotte herself, and endeavoured to put a stop to the exclamations of her mother and sisters by the earnestness of her congratulations to Sir William, in which she was readily joined by Jane, and by making a variety of remarks on the happiness that might be expected from the match the excellent character of Mr. Collins and the convenient distance of Huntsford from London. Mrs. Bennet was, in fact, too much overpowered to say a great deal while Sir William remained, but no sooner had he left them than her feelings found a rapid vent. In the first place, she persisted in disbelieving the whole of the matter. Secondly, she was very sure that Mr. Collins had been taken in. Thirdly, she trusted that they would never be happy together. And fourthly, that the match might be broken off. Two inferences, however, were plainly deduced from the whole. One, that Elizabeth was the real cause of the mischief, and the other, that she herself had been barbarously misused by them all. And on these two points, she principally dwelt during the rest of the day. Nothing could console and nothing could appease her. Nor did that day wear out her resentment. A week elapsed before she could see Elizabeth without scolding her. A month passed away before she could speak to Sir William or Lady Lucas without being rude. And many months were gone before she could at all forgive their daughter. Mr. Bennet's emotions were much more tranquil on the occasion. And such as he did experience, he pronounced to be of a most agreeable sort, for it gratified him, he said, to discover that Charlotte Lucas, whom he had been used to think tolerably sensible, was as foolish as his wife, and more foolish than his daughter. Jane confessed herself a little surprised at the match, but she said less of her astonishment than of her earnest earnest desire for their happiness. Nor could Elizabeth persuade her to consider it as improbable. Kitty and Lydia... I don't know what Violet's doing back there. Kitty and Lydia were far from... (laughs) Violet! 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 Did you find something in the car? Um... Jane confessed herself, well, we really did all that. Um, uh, Kitty and Lydia were far from envying, were far from envying Miss Lucas, for Mr. Collins was only a clergyman, and it affected them in no other way than as a piece of news to spread at Meryton. Lady Lucas could not be insensible of triumph on being able to retort on Mrs. Bennet the comfort of having a daughter well married, and she called at Longbourn rather oftener than usual to say how happy she was, though Mrs. Bennet's sour looks and ill-natured remarks might have been enough to drive happiness away. 
Between Elizabeth and Charlotte, there was a restraint which kept them mutually silent on the subject, and Elizabeth felt persuaded that no real confidence could ever subsist between them again. Her disappointment in Charlotte made her turn with fonder regard to her sister, of whose rectitude and delicacy she was sure her opinion could never be shaken. Sorry, I don't know what violence sticking back there. Um, and for whose happiness she grew daily more anxious as Bingley had now been gone a week and nothing more was heard of his return. Jane had sent Caroline an early answer to her letter and was counting the days till she might reasonably hope to hear again. The promise promised letter of thanks from Mr. Collins arrived on Tuesday, addressed to their father and written with all the solemnity of gratitude which a 12 months abode in the family might have prompted. After discharging his conscience on that head, he proceeded to inform them with many rapturous expressions of his happiness in having obtained the affection of their, their amiable neighbour, Miss Lucas, and then explained that it was merely with the view of enjoying her society that he had been so ready to close with their kind wish of seeing him again at Longbourn, whither he hoped to be able to return on Monday fortnight for Lady Catherine, he added, so heartily approved his marriage that she wished it to take place as soon as possible, which he trusted would be an unanswer an unanswerable argument with his amiable Charlotte to name an early day for making him the happy happiest of men. Mr. Collins's return into Hertfordshire was no longer a matter of pleasure to Mrs. Bennet. On the contrary, she was as much disposed to complain of it as her husband. It was very strange that he should come to Longbourn instead of to Lucas Lodge. It was also very inconvenient and exceedingly troublesome. She hated having visitors in the house while her health was so indifferent. And lovers were of all people the most disagreeable. Such were the gentle murmurs of Mrs. Bennet, and they gave way only to the greater distress of Mr. Bingley's continued absence. Neither Jane nor Elizabeth were comfortable on this subject. Day after day passed away without bringing any other tidings of him than the report which shortly prevailed in Meryton of his coming no more to Netherfield. Hey, Violet! I think Violet, I think she's found a ball under the seat. Let me have a look one sec. What you got? What you got? Where's that pulpit? Huh? Let's see if we can find you. There you go. Here. Um. There you go. Uh. Um. Neither Jane nor... Ba -ba 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 -ba. Neither Jane nor Elizabeth were comfortable on this subject. Day after day passed without bringing any other tidings of him than his report, which shortly prevailed in Meryton, of his coming no more to Netherfield the whole winter. A report which highly incensed Mrs. Bennet, and which she never failed to contradict as a most scandalous falsehood. Even Elizabeth began to fear, not that Bingley was indifferent, but that his sister's would be successful in keeping him away. Unwilling as she was to admit an idea so destructive of Jane's happiness and so dishonorable to the stability of her lover, she could not prevent its frequently occurring. The united efforts of his two unfeeling sisters and of his overpowering friend, assisted by the attractions of Miss Darcy and the amusements of London might be too much, she feared for the strength of his attachment by was shaking the whole car. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh. Um, as for Jane, her anxiety... Her... As for Jane, her anxiety under the suspense was of course more painful than Elizabeth's. But whatever she felt, she was desirous of concealing and between herself and Elizabeth therefore the subject was never alluded to 
but as no such delicacy restrained her mother, an hour seldom passed in which she did not talk of Bingley, express her impatience for his arrival, or even require Jane to confess that if he did not come back, she would think herself very ill-used. It needed all Jane's steady mildness to bear these attacks with tolerable tranquility. Mr. Collins returned most punctually on Monday fortnight, but his reception at Longbourn was not quite so gracious as it had been on his first introduction. He was too happy, however, to need much attention, and luckily for the others, the business of lovemaking relieved them from a great deal of his company. The chief of... What are you eating? What are you eating? The chief of every day was spent by him at Lucas Lodge, and he sometimes returned to Longbourn only in time to make an apology for his absence before the family went to bed. Mrs. Bennet was really... You never know what you're going to find to eat in our car. Mrs. Bennet was really in a most pitiable state. The very mention of anything concerning the match threw her into an agony of ill humour, and wherever she went, she was sure of hearing it talked of. The sight of Miss Lucas... Oh, I love you too. <laughs> the sight of Miss Lucas was odious to her. As her successor in that house, she regarded her with jealous abhorrence. Whenever Charlotte came to, in to, came to see them, she concluded her to be anticipating the hour of possession, and whenever she spoke in a low voice to Mr. Collins, was convinced that they were talking of the Longbourn estate and resolving to turn herself and her daughters out of the house as soon as Mr. Bennet were dead. She complained bitterly of all this to her husband. Indeed, Mr. Bennet, said she, it is very hard to think that Charlotte Lucas should ever be mistress of this house, that I should be forced to make way for her and live to see her take her place in it. My dear, do not give way to such gloomy thoughts. Let us hope for better things. Let us flatter ourselves that I may be the survivor. <laughs> This was not very consoling to Mrs. Bennet, and therefore, instead of making any answer, she went on as before. I cannot bear to think that they should have all this estate. If it were not for the entail, I should not mind it. What should you not mind? I should not mind anything at all. Let us be thankful that you are preserved from a state of such insensibility. I can never, I never can be thankful, Mr. Bennet, for anything about the entail. How can how anyone could have the conscience to entail away an estate from one's own daughters, I cannot understand. And all for the sake of Mr. Collins, too. Why should he have it more than anybody else? I leave it to yourself to determine, said Mr. Bennet. Chapter 24. Miss Bingley's letter arrived and put an end to doubt. The very first sentence conveyed the assurance of their being all settled in London for the winter and concluded with her brother's regret at not having had time to pay his respects to his friends in Hertfordshire before he left the country. Hope was over, entirely over, and when Jane could attend to the rest of the letter, she found little except the professed affection of the writer that could give her any comfort. Miss Darcy's praise occupied the chief of it. Her many attractions were again dwelt on, and Charlotte boasted joyfully of their increasing intimacy and ventured to predict the accomplishment of the wishes which she had been which had been unfolded in her former letter. She wrote also with great pleasure of her brother's being an inmate in inmate being of of her brother's being an inmate of Mr Darcy's house and mentioned with raptures some plans of the latter with regard to new furniture. Elizabeth, to whom Jane very soon communicated the chief of all this, heard it in silent indignation. Her heart was divided between concern for her sister and resentment against all others. 
To Caroline's assertion of her brother's being partial to Miss Darcy, she paid no credit. That he was really fond of Jane, she doubted no more than she had ever done, and much as she had always been disposed to like him, she could not think without anger, hardly without contempt, on that easiness of temper, that want of proper resolution, which made him now, which made him the slave of his designing friends, and led him to sacrifice of his own happiness to the caprice of their inclination. Had his own happiness, however, been the only sacrifice, he might have been allowed to sport with it in whatever manner he thought best, but her sister's was involved in it, as she thought he must be sensible himself. It was a subject, in short, on which reflection would be long indulged and must be unavailing. She could think of nothing else and yet, whether Bingley's regard had really died away or were suppressed by his friend's interference, whether he had been aware of Jane's attachment or whether it had escaped his observation, whatever were the case, though her opinion of him must be materially affected by the indifference, her sister's situation remained the same, her peace equally wounded. A day or two passed before Jane had courage to speak of her feelings to Elizabeth. But at last, on Mrs. Bennet's leaving them together, after a longer irritation than usual about Netherfield and its master, she could not help saying, Oh, that my dear mother had more command over herself. She can have no idea of the pain she gives me by her continual reflections on him, but I will not repine. It cannot la last long. He will be forgot. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs>